Welcome back. Uh, my guest in this segment is Mark Nikanen. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about uh, the climate situation, which, on top of everything else, is uh, trending into disaster, I think. I think that's a, an accurate statement. It's kind of interesting, too, because we're doing this interview, and the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, is very much in the news. But it can't, you can't help but think about the fact that what never goes out of awareness, or shouldn't, is the climate crisis. And you and I had talked about looking at 2019, and 2019 was, in many respects, a bellwether. Because in 2019, we had the second hottest year on record, which is an ongoing trend. It happens, it's seemingly every year now for the past decade. And it would have been uh, the hottest year, except there was one El Nino year that was hotter. That tends to pump temperatures just a little bit higher. And so then we began 2020 with the news out of Australia, which you and I have talked about a little bit. I mean, that was absolutely, that was like looking the old movie on the beach. I mean, people were on the beach, on the beach with flames and smoke in the background and an estimated one billion animals were killed and just burned to death. And I think that what we're seeing now, unfortunately, is very much what the early climate modelers said would happen. There's an interesting guy at UC Berkeley, he's a climate scientist named Zeke Hausfather, and he went back and looked at all the, the modeling that was done 30 years ago. And what he found was that even with the far less sophisticated computer modeling that they had at that time, they came, those scientists came within such precision about where we are now. But here's the historical irony as far as I'm concerned. There was another group of scientists at Exxon and other major oil producers. And those scientists were doing their work honestly. And what they found in the 80s and predicted with uncanny accuracy was the one degree Celsius temperature rise that would exist right now, which is accurate, and even the carbon load in the atmosphere with uncanny accuracy. Of course, they never reported that. Uh, executives for the big oil companies never let that news go out, and we wouldn't even know about it if Inside Climate News hadn't won a Pulitzer for publishing that material. Um, a year ago. Yeah. And I'm sure at the time the media did know about it because the media always knows. People go to the media, the scientists, and they say, look what we're doing. But they didn't report it because... Well, yeah, what was interesting about the media was they readily reported on an ongoing basis the multi-million dollar propaganda campaign put out by big oil and big gas saying that there was no problem with fossil fuels and that these scientists and environmentalists and indigenous leaders who were so concerned about the carbon load were absolutely being ridiculous. They were defamed. There were all the institutes that were funded by these people. And yet, the chickens have come home to roost because the accuracy, whether it was Exxon and their scientists or the early climate scientists working in universities and think tanks, their uh, reports were all very, very accurate and very, very frightening in their ramifications. And I think you could probably go back 100 years even before that and climate change was known about and, uh, and predicted. Yeah, the Swedish scientists uh, actually... So here we are, what are we gonna do? Yeah. What we're gonna do, what we continue to do, which is to write about it, talk about it, and some of us protest about it, and we're trying to draw attention to it. I think that there's not a whole lot more that we can do at this point, but the good news, we're gonna go back to talking about 2019, the good news was that we had seven million people take to the streets to protest and demand that governments and corporations, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference, take the climate emergency seriously. And that was very, very important, as was the amazing efforts of youth and indigenous people 
people like Greta Thunberg, and uh, obviously we've seen indigenous leaders of, uh, of a youthful age in this community of Victoria really forcing attention on this issue as well. You know, why do we have to? Why? I mean, what we're fighting for here is the future of human civilization as well as the entire planet. And why do we have to fight our governments in order to do this? Uh, I think it's what's, pretty... They're, 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 they are so corrupt, so gone from us, you know, because they know the answers are there and they're not that hard to do. It just means we have to go in different directions and everybody will be happier except for the people at the top who are making all the money from all of this stuff. Well, and a, they run the show. Well, there's a tremendous amount of money and the really daunting thing is that the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is very clear that we have to reduce our carbon emissions almost 8% a year over the next 10 years. Well, Jack, no major developed country is reducing it, period. It's you growing. Know what? As of today, we can't say that because what's happening because of the coronavirus is the world is being shut down. Air travel is down. The cruise ship industry is sinking. Um, Italy is locked down. People are unable to travel. People aren't traveling. Concerts are closed. Movies are closed. Hockey games are being played in front of no fans. So we may yet hit that 10% come down. It looks like that is what is now happening. And that's uh, completely unexpected. And it'll be interesting to see how that pans out at the end of the year. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a planned event. Don't be so sure. <laughs> <laughs> well. But let's not go there. <laughs> So anyway, that's, uh, 2019 was a very, very interesting year. There was the good news because um, it seemed like millions of citizens finally had had it. And of course, it was the bad news because temperatures continued to rise. Yeah. We just finished massive flooding in the Mississippi Delta, the South Pole, anyways, the whole thing. We have to move, here, in, here in, in Canada, we should be moving to rail as fast as we possibly can. As, and what's wrong with our, and closing down pipelines and finding the jobs elsewhere. I mean, we just, we just have to change direction. We can have a more prosperous society for everybody, but we have to change directions or we're gonna kill ourselves. And we have to also regain or gain control of our governments, take, take control of our governments away from the 1% of the 1%, so our governments begin to work for us. And we can really begin to make very positive strides very quickly. What's interesting about that transition is that's precisely what Canadians are calling for in the Green New Deal that they want and what the Green New Deal would do in America, which is put re all these people to work building the infrastructure yeah. for a new economy, yeah. a green economy. Yeah. It's not a, you know, not a zero-sum universe here. Yeah. It's vi we can all win in this situation. And survive, which is no small. Which is yeah, sort of where we're <laughs> right. at. So I want to talk a bit about housing sure, here I... in the city of Victoria. A couple of weeks ago, I sent a, an email to Saanich Council and Victoria Council. And basically, the email started by saying, if you look out the front window of Saanich City Hall, you will see two malls there, which cover about two hectares of land. And it's all parking lot and uh, one-story retail. And if you move all the way from Sandwich City Hall all the way down to Mayfair Mall, which is quite a distance, the entire area is parking lots, malls, one story this and one story that. Um, it could have been used to solve, I think, a big part of our housing crisis. In fact, we never needed to have a housing crisis. And especially if we had merged that idea with opening up all that land for housing, and mixing in our federal and provincial governments saying to non-residents of Canada, no, you cannot come in here and speculate on our housing. But instead they said the exact opposite. They welcomed the world to come in and buy up our housing. Uh, as well as the whole uh, casino gate thing where, I mean, so we see our federal government and our provincial government and our city governments too. It's almost like they're working together to create this housing crisis, which is costing so many people so dearly in terms of substandard housing, homelessness, and the high rents and high house prices that people are having to work so hard to pay for. And 
I don't think any of that was by accident. People are making fortunes at the top from selling condos that are worth $100,000 for $500,000. And we as a nation don't really see it because the media won't talk about it and the politicians won't talk about it. And even here at ground level with our city governments, why won't, I didn't get any answers. Why won't you zone this land for housing? There's no answer. And that's what I was curious about, how they responded to your query. I got no response at all from Saanich City Council. I was told by the staff that they had passed the email on to council. I got no response at all. Uh, in Victoria, where there are also similar, all the way from downtown to Mayfair Mall, it's all single-story retail, strip malls, and parking lots, and car dealerships, the whole thing. Again, you could build thousands of how units of housing. Why is it? Well, I got an answer from one uh, councillor who said they'd looked into it and there was public opinion that said they want to keep that as uh, light industrial. Okay, there's a crisis. I don't remember myself. I've lived here for a long time, ever being asked, but maybe you did ask somebody. So who did you ask and what were the numbers and blah, blah. No response whatsoever. Why haven't the people of the city been asked? What do we want to do with our city? And this could have been done without going into all the established neighborhoods that the developers are breaking into and just causing chaos when the whole thing could be done elsewhere. One of the things, too, about the housing crisis that really is concerning to me is that the millennial generation, and this would be a natural constituency for what you're talking about, have been deprived of wealth in a way that our baby boomer generation was not. When we were baby boomers, and these are US figures, but I suspect there's a parallel. Um, when baby boomers were in their, the age of the millennials, they held about 25 to 30% of the national wealth. In the United States now, that's in the low single digits. And the reason largely for that is housing, because they can't get into the housing market. And we all know young people who are looking at a future being permanent renters because who can cobble together $100,000 as a down payment for that overpriced $500,000 condo you're talking about? And none of it is necessary. It's just been a massive theft, especially from young people, by the 1% of the 1%. It's also interesting to me, Jack, that in Italy, which you mentioned a few moments ago, where things are so shut down right now, the Italian government is calling and ordering a moratorium on mortgages being paid um, because people can't work. It'll be interesting to see how that flies in North America. Wow. Yeah. Because yes. people are going to be subjected to self-isolation. They can't work. Not everybody can work from home. A lot of people in the service industry have to actually move out into the community to do that. What are the provisions going to be for those folks? They're not only suffering a housing crisis, they could very soon be suffering a wage and, um, and, and uh, job crisis as well. Yeah. You know, Europe did build itself. We're out of time. Mark, thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. A few weeks ago, there were protests throughout Victoria by a coalition of environmental groups and indigenous peoples, and they were focusing on the ministries. Extinction Rebellion, Vancouver Island, went ahead and protested at the Justice Center. And that was where I met and talked with Mike McKenzie. Mike is a hereditary leader and community member of the Sequecum Nation. He was there because he was very interested to see how the government was handling the Wet'suwet'en situation. Not well, in his opinion. And the reason he had such a vested interest in it is that the Sequecum Nation is right in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So they're keeping their eyes on it. We're watching really closely what's going on because when the pipeline for the Trans Mountain Pipeline is going to be coming into our territory this year, um, this is exactly how I believe they're going to treat our people. They've said that we've given our consent. They've said the bands on the line have given their consent. But what's actually happened is that mutual benefit agreements have been signed with chiefs and communities. And some of those mutual benefit agreements were signed before any of the people even knew that this project was going to be built. 
And so part of some of those benefit agreements is making sure that our communities don't speak out and speak up. It's also making sure that our communities receive money from the project, but it isn't consent. And so this is a little bit of the same thing that is happening up in Wet'suwet'en territory. And so we're watching closely on the CGL and the LNG process to see how Trans Mountain is going to come into our nation. I need to ask you if you've ever spoken to Prime Minister Trudeau directly, face to face, about the issue of the pipelines. Me and Trudeau spoke uh, face to face in 2013. Uh, he took pictures with me, he was big on that, he took selfies with all of our elders and we blanketed him and he uh, agreed not to build the pipeline, he agreed to uh, recognition of rights and a, and a relationship based on respect. A few other things he said is that when, when these projects make no sense or they infringe upon our rights, they will rescind them. They also said they would review the laws that, that uh, complicate things for us when we're fighting for our rights. Right now in Canada, coming into this next year, um, it's now 2020, it's been several years since I've seen Trudeau. He did not come back to our territory after that meeting except for a fundraiser last year before the election. I think what's going to happen is that the government of Canada is either going to use the military or the RCMP with force and they're going to come in and they're going to build all the sections of the pipeline either at the same time or simultaneously and they're going to oppress our peoples that are on the front line because our elders uh, council specifically said no. So we have direction in our nation from our elders council to reject and oppose the Kinder Morgan, which is now the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Prime Minister Trudeau actually said to you back in 2013 that that TMX was not going to be built. Yep. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah, Tr Trudeau said that TMX would not be built. At the time it was Kinder Morgan. One of the things though that he emphasized is that these projects weren't going to go through under his government, that he was going to change the process and that the reconciliation in Canada was going to mean something. Do you feel personally betrayed on the basis of what he said to you face to face? Absolutely. Absolutely. He came and he disrespected all of my elders, all of our leadership and everybody that was in that room that day. He said that this is something that we're going to do and take seriously, and then he never came back to our territory until he was fundraising for his election again. What happened then? Well, there was a large uh, protest. Uh, hundreds of people gathered outside of the Coast Hotel where he had his fundraiser, and then hundreds more gathered outside of the university where he had his town hall. And inside the town hall, our people told him he does not have a deed, he does not have consent, and he's going to have to go up against our people if he wants to put this through. What does that mean, go up against our people? Because now you're looking right down the barrel of that yeah, pipe. Yeah, and so I've asked the Tribal Council what they're gonna do if the pipeline comes through. They said the several, including the Tribal Chief, said that he would be on the front line right in front of it to stop it. Uh, a lot of our elders are ready to be on the front line. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are actually calling it the Standing Rock of the North. There's already tiny houses and people that are up on the, up on the line in Blue River. And uh, up in Jasper is the beginning of our territory, but it's also the beginning of our headwaters. And so that pipeline goes right across the Fraser River, and that could devastate the, the water system all the way through the entire uh, province. And the biggest thing here is that we also have a declaration called Save the Fraser. So more than 50 uh, bands have signed on to an agreement to protect the Fraser River. So there's a lot of implications here all the way around as to who's going to stand up. It sounds like there's an enormous, enormous number of things at stake here. Yeah, yeah. Reconciliation is at stake. Uh, there's no possibility to reconcile with our nation if this pipeline goes through. There is the, the, the suggestion that by purchasing the pipeline or owning the pipeline, that could be reconciliation. But the reality is, is the first pipeline that existed was, was pushed through. Um, in, the in the 1950s, when Indigenous peoples weren't allowed to represent themselves in court, when the Indian agent was in control of Indigenous peoples, and when the Indian Act forbid a lot of activities on reserves. So um, there was no way to fight that original pipeline. That's where they believe that they get the right to do this because they call it the pipeline right away, and they're going to build this pipeline right next to the first one. And so the reality is, is that they think that they have this ability because in the 50s they got that ability from the Indian agent, but they don't have that right. And now that we're talking about reconciliation, now that we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about saving the planet at this point. And, and Canada is going to go out of its way to grossly and, and, and 
without any regard for indigenous rights, put through this uh, pipeline in the name of progress and economic development, and progress in this country is not disrespecting indigenous rights. What would you expect or hope for from the settler community? I think that everybody that is uh, living with us in community, in our house and in our ranch, as we call it as Sequatin people, and, and in all of the other houses and the ranches of British Columbia, all of us that live together in these communities, we need to stand together because we need to understand what kind of a relationship that we want to have going into the future. 80 years from now, what are our children going to have? We're called, um, what we call ourselves is the link between seven generations. And so if this link isn't strong, the next seven generations will suffer. And so we really need to stand up now so that the future generations don't have to. My dad's been fighting this for 50 years, and so here I am fighting this as well. You're embarking on something that is truly revolutionary, the Indigenous International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about that? So we're going to start an international Indigenous Court of Justice. We're going to look at prosecuting and uh, prosecutor prosecutorial powers of our elders as justices. And we're going to pilot this, we're going to go through and we're going to see exactly, we're going to address reconciliation, but we're also going to address justice. And so the way that the leadership, right now what's happening is genocide. And so we need to talk about it and we need to talk to our elders. We need to bring those people together to understand genocide and to bring a publication back to the Canadians to understand exactly what it is that we're talking about. Do you expect to have an international reach with it? Yes, yes I do. We have allies in Ecuador, we have allies in Russia, we have allies in um, countries all around the world who are indigenous. Um, especially down in the United States of America right now where they're going, uh, undergoing a lot of uh, injustices with their people. So uh, we're going to start at home, but we will uh, hope to see what happens with the rest of the world. I would love it if you could explain to people why the hereditary chiefs are so integral and so important to indigenous peoples here in British Columbia and why the elected chiefs are a separate classification entirely. What is the significance and the differences? So it, thousands and thousands and thousands of years indigenous peoples have occupied these lands. The reason that they've been able to live a long time without climate change, without devastation of, of their infrastructure, which was their homes and their communities, is because they respected the land and they lived in harmony with the land, but they had laws on how they conduct themselves, how they conduct themselves with each other, how they conduct themselves with the animal world, with the plant world, with the, with the earth and the water and the air. And so these laws is what uh, hereditary systems uphold, are upheld by. Um, the, the whole, for my nation, we have family system, which is our family heads. And our family heads, they oversee the process. And we would elect a different chief here and there. Uh, in the context of, of Canadian understanding, we would elect a, a chief and we would say, okay, we're going fishing, we're going we're gonna to elect a fishing chief and that person has the knowledge. And for some nations, they would, they would go to war and they would elect a war chief. For, um, and so this was, leadership was more like popcorn leadership. People would step up at the time and then they would step back because the community was whole. Um, the reality is that with the hereditary leadership today, they're not being respected by the government of Canada and the province of British Columbia in policy, which is the highest form of law in their government. And so the actual uh, process of parliament and legislature needs to respect the laws of the hereditary chiefs. Elected band councillors and chiefs are accountable to the ministers and they're accountable under the Indian Act to the government of Canada. They are elected in by some people in communities but for example in my community it's less than a hundred of 500 people and that can be an entire family that elected somebody in. Um, maybe two families when you have 13 or more families in a community. And so really what is happening across Canada and when, you, when we look at the context of grassroots people, those are the people who are standing up, who are powerless at home and powerless within their system and powerless within the Indian Act. A lot of people 
um, don't also find their power in the Indian Act. So they empower themselves, and that's what sovereignty is. That's what the hereditary chiefs are taking on, is their sovereign jurisdiction, their sovereign title and jurisdiction in British Columbia. It sounds like divide and conquer. Yeah, it's absolutely divide and conquer, because when you have a subset of our nation working towards uh, one goal, and you have the other part of our nation working towards uh, nationhood and sovereignty, uh, recognition of rights, recognition of, of land title and jurisdiction. Um, you've got the government playing us against each other. And it's really unfortunate because we don't have, uh, a lot of people want us to deal with this internally inside of our systems, but when we deal with it internally inside of our systems, we're all pitted against each other right from the beginning. So it's a lot of fighting happening when you've got different negotiations, different agreements, different community goals, different community values. Um, and for our people, we were nomadic people anyway. So the reserve system is just about putting us in one spot and not allowing us to move around. No access, no consent. No access, no consent. No Sovereignty access. is about your right to govern yourself. So self-governance in this country and the way that in the context that it's spoken about in politics and in media is not the same self-governance that's been handed down to us as Indigenous peoples. The, the inherent self-governance that we have is right here in our hearts. And we walk in a good way. See, when we talk about it takes a community to raise a child, when that child grows up to a certain age, that child goes out and does their passage of rites. And they do their ceremonies. And they become connected to the land and connected to their community and connected to each other. Uh, they can be trusted to walk in a good way. And they carry that self-governance inside. That, that's sovereignty for Indigenous people. It's about walking in your own strength and walking your path with integrity and with dignity and with belonging. In our nation, our elders say that we're a dream of the land itself. We came from the land, we came from the animals, we came from the plant world. My traditional name is Musum no Asanina Pau. That is in Cree because that's where I went and I did my ceremony. And I have roots in the Cree nation as well. And Musum no Asanina Pau means grandfather round rock. And I asked myself, what does that mean as a sovereign? What does it mean to stand in that and to truly understand it? But the elder said that means the circle of life. It means that all of you are one of you and you're all together as one. So I take my sovereignty seriously. I understand my ability to connect with the land, to connect with other people. And sovereignty and ceremony is so important. That's how come the throne speech that was interrupted was such a historical day for people. Because without ceremony, it's just a speech. Indigenous peoples are saying, wait a second, we were the ones who've been here for thousands of years. We're the ones who protected the land and now we're seeing climate change. So we're also saying that we need to continue to protect the land, that our laws are paramount or else the human species will not survive. That was Mike McKenzie hereditary leader of the Sequecum Nation, a fighter, a wise man. Take care, stay strong. <laughs>